Welcome to Edison TV. I'm Andrew Keane, and we're here today to update you on the progress of Edison client Provaris Energy, the Australian company set on developing new supply chains for green hydrogen using compression and maritime transportation. Provaris is pursuing several strategies for green hydrogen worldwide, including a production plant in Northern Australia and exports to Southeast Asia. Central to its plans is the creation of a new class of ocean-going compressed hydrogen vessel known as the H2neo. In this session, we're going to explore the opportunity that exists for Provaris in Europe. The company recently opened an office in Oslo, with Norway, a country key to European renewables and energy transition, strategically positioned to engage in low carbon hydrogen distribution. And the early fruits of the Norway connection has included the signing of an MOU with Norwegian Hydrogen. With us today are Per Rød, Provaris Chief Technical Officer, and Dr. Ulrich Bunga from Norwegian Energy Partners, known as Norweb, the public-private organization tasked to assist with the internationalization of the Norwegian energy market. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Per, good to have you with us again. If, if I can start with you, can you tell us about why the MOU with Norwegian Hydrogen is of such significance to Provaris's energy plans in Europe? Our partnership with Norwegian Hydrogen is, is, is great in that they're very advanced in their experience and, and knowledge about compression and hydrogen as well. They're, they're already uh, developing a, a pilot project in Norway that's going to be done by the end of the year. And that's going to give us a lot of, of, of input from their side, but in permitting and accessibility in Norway. We're doing, you know, our own upstream project. We're, we're gaining a lot of experience on the, the full value chain when it comes to hydrogen, upstream transportation, downstream. And when we put all our collective knowledge together here, we're going to be able to fast track this project and be able to supply green hydrogen into, into Europe in, in 2027. I think that's going to be the first one. So that's why this is very key and very exciting for us. What are we talking about in terms of potential routes or expert de destinations? Which, which routes make the most sense? Well, we talked about the sweet spot for, for our ships. The, the H2neo, which is the, the smaller vessel that we have, it's up to 2,000 nautical miles, right? So if you, if you look at Norway, if you go all the way up north, close to the Russian border as you can, you're 1,400 nautical miles and you're into very key import markets in Europe. Then you're in the Netherlands, Belgium, Northern Germany. So we can come to Wilhelmshaven, Hamburg, Bremen, and then there's a number of other opportunities that are even closer. So we're looking at, you know, export areas and, and sites in Norway that is maybe four or 500 nautical miles. And then suddenly you're into the major importing hubs for hydrogen in, in Europe. So very short distance which make it economical and, and affordable with, with compression. If you look at in the rest of the Nordics, you got Denmark, there's opportunities in Sweden, but also beyond that, Scotland, Iceland, there's a number of areas that are very close. So our focus has been, you know, let's try and, and, and get the, 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 the customers to focus on what do they need and where is the most affordable place to, to get the green hydrogen from. Can you remind us of the, the technology at play here? Can you tell us about the H2neo carrier and, and the technology that you're using? But what we focus is on is just compressing the hydrogen to 250 bar. That avoids a lot of technology, new technology, a lot of costs, expenses, energy in order to convert the hydrogen into another means to, for transporting it. But what that means for our ships is essentially tanks that are integrated into the ship of the hull that can carry up to 250 bar. So there's a new cargo containment system, which is a nested steel structure that allows us to build up pressure. Compression itself is, is well established. That's been around for decades. You got big uh, OEMs in the market already supplying compressors. So there's nothing there on either end of the, the shipping side of the, the value chain. We got an, an, an approval in principle from class on this back in 2021. We focused a lot on, on the engineering of that over the last year. And, and in December, we got a design approval from ABS. So we're moving along very quickly now. We have approvals in place. We are continuing to test the prototype that will be done uh, within this year and, and we'll be ready 
to, to sign shipbuilding contracts within this year as well. So you've already got established relationships with technology partners for ship and port operations. This is all technically achievable now. Yeah, it is achievable now. So, you know, when it looks at the, 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 the shore side compression, discharge, et cetera, that's already very established technology on the ship itself. You know, the only thing that's new is, is the tank, that, the steel, and, and, and the focus there is how we, we can effectively integrate that into a ship. And then it's a way of finding, you know, renewable energy sources so that we can actually transport our cargo, our green cargo in, in green ways as well. And so we have a very flexible solution when it comes to propulsion of the ships. We can go fully green. We can use different types of fuel, different types of, of uh, energy producers. So yeah, uh, we're tied up in a number of, of different uh, technology suppliers that, that can help us uh, get this done. Thanks, Ben. That, that's really interesting. Well, Ulrich, if, if I can turn to you now, um, can you give us some sense of the infrastructural dynamics for hydrogen in Europe uh, you know, through Norway's experience? What, what's the current state of play? Uh, from a Norwegian perspective, uh, which Norweb is representing here, there's uh, two aspects to that. Uh, one aspect is the Norwegian energy market itself and its dynamics. And secondly, of course, as a potential offtaker of hydrogen, the European uh, Commission's development. In the Norwegian energy market, uh, that is dominated by well, a lot of experience uh, collected and tradition in the fossil energy production and uh, also use. But again, uh, mostly uh, uh, fossil energy export, natural gas and oil uh, have given uh, Norway a, a rich experience and, and competence. In. But there is also renewable energy, mostly hydropower, uh, which has been used in, in domestic uh, markets, uh, not so much for, for export. Uh, Norway today is uh, actually uh, contributing uh, around about a quarter of the uh, natural gas needs in, in, in Europe. So if there's a lot of export, and uh, which is uh, at the same time about three to four times uh, EU's uh, uh, well, hydrogen consumption, yeah? so just to, to get the scale right. Uh, also, Norway has, uh, or part of that is a strategy, a national hydrogen strategy, which has been uh, published in, in 2020. It comprises all sectors uh, of the, the uh, value chain. And uh, so as, as a result of concrete result out of that, there was a first uh, um, agreement uh, between Norway and, and one of the, the German, uh, the, the European member states, uh, Germany, uh, to, to sign a declaration that by the year 2030, uh, a first hydrogen pipeline infrastructure shall be in place. So to transport maybe first blue hydrogen, uh, and later on green hydrogen, but on green hydrogen here, our focus definitely is. Uh, finally, uh, the other perspective is European offtake, hydrogen offtake, the, the, the market. And uh, Europe has uh, a very well pronounced, uh, pronounced hydrogen strategy. So uh, by 2030, there should be around about uh, 20 million tons of, of hydrogen to be consumed, about half of which shall be imported. And to this half uh, of imports, which then would be around about 10 million tons of hydrogen per year, uh, Norway has definitely uh, committed to contribute. How do you see the opportunities for Provaris to apply their compressed hydrogen transport solution to the region? What are the challenges and the opportunities? Well, uh, first of all, the question, of course, is where does the hydrogen come from? And again, if we look at, at green hydrogen, uh, Hydropower is, is not the, the business. However, it is much more the, the new renewables coming on board, which can be off, onshore wind and, and offshore wind energy. Onshore wind energy can be rapidly developed uh, in specific regions in, in Norway, <clears throat> whereas uh, offshore wind energy will have uh, high, very high potential, up to 14,000 terawatts hours per year, which can only be well <clears throat> utilized or brought into the market later in time than onshore wind energy, and specifically not in, in all, uh, all the, the potential regions. So uh, that being said, uh, I, there should be a clear uh, strategy, we believe, uh, to build on uh, utilization of onshore wind energy in the early days to start up with because of price <clears throat> specifically, but again, it might be more remote. 
So here, Probaris uh, technology is uh, a robust missing link almost uh, to tap into these uh, remote sources, which cannot be uh, opened up by, by pipeline, pipeline business, pipeline coming on uh, later. Um, and I think with the Provar solution, we can uh, <clears throat> we'll start into the market uh, well before 2030. So uh, we called it the milk carrier route. Yeah? Uh, so we can uh, robustly and flexibly uh, put hydrogen, take hydrogen on board or deliver it along the route. So it's a, also a very flexible approach, as we believe. Yeah, this is a really interesting thing because you know where, where you find green hydrogen production is often not necessarily where you get demand. So you know what, what kind of trade routes do you, do you think might open up? Well, kind of natural uh, for the time being, uh, specifically as we have this declaration being signed uh, last year. Uh, Germany is kind of a, a very focal market, but also other markets in Europe, like the Netherlands or Belgium uh, or other places, are the, the, the typical uh, well, end users. Um, and again, this route we are looking here for the Provence H2 dealership is part of a concert. So it, of course, it finds natural competition. So it has to defend itself against these competitors. Uh, like uh, we are these days we are discussing to, to also import hydrogen from, from maybe North Africa or other places in Europe, Spain, uh, yeah, the Mediterranean uh, countries, Italy, Greece, Portugal, and so forth. But again, we are looking at a very specific application, which is <clears throat> short to medium term distances to places where we have stranded renewables available. And that gives us the, the super chance, specifically looking at, at the short term timedness of, of the approach and also the, <clears throat> the fairly low price of onshore wind energy to tap into first. So early markets and uh, um, <clears throat> specifically uh, uh, stranded markets, which could otherwise not be used. And it's not in competition with pipeline business. It's, uh, it's kind of an elongation, it's, it's, a, it's a parallel uh, development. Uh, I would even dare to say it's kind of a win-win situation uh, also for the pipeline industry and the shipping, the compressed hydrogen shipping business. Thanks, Ulrich, that's really interesting. Um, Lars, if I can come back to you, Per, we've got potential trade routes opening uh, within Europe, particularly from Norway to start with, on, on scales and that, that fit your technology? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with the, the, the recent approvals that we have now for our technology as well, we, we feel like we're in the driver's seat to, to, to make this happen uh, within this decade as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the economics. You know, can you give us an idea on the costs of transporting hydrogen using the H2NEO? within Europe and, and beyond? It all depends on, on volumes and distance, right? So it, it's not a, a set figure for, for everything. And I think uh, just following up a little bit about what Uli said earlier about, you know, stranded renewable energy and, and everything else, I think the, the compression gives you a level of flexibility right now. We, we're talking to different uh, developers and, 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 and off takers, but, it, but it, big sort of range in, in what they want to do. Some people are looking at 2,000 tons per annum and, and others are looking up to a million tons per annum, right? And over time here, bringing in these, a fleet of ships here, we can, we can possibly service a lot of it and help companies scale up their activities, right? But if you're talking about just on, on, on the costing side, of, of course, the bigger the volumes and, and, and the, the, the economies of scale will be there. But if you look at let's say a thousand nautical mile range, right? So mentioned Norway earlier as anything from, let's say four or 500 up to 1400. So take something in between, so a thousand nautical miles. Then, you know, if you start at modest volumes, uh, 20,000 uh, tons per annum, you know, you're looking at sub $2 per kilo for, for the, 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 the shipping transportation segment of it. Uh, and if you go up to to a hundred thousand using the H2 Neos, you're 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 down to about a dollar per kilo, right? Uh, scaling up even further, we get into our next series of ships, which we call the H2 Max. So that's two thousand tons uh, cargo capacity, and then we're going to be under a dollar for for delivering uh, hydrogen on a, on a levelized cost basis. And when you start comparing that to 
the costs and the processes involving converting hydrogen into another cargo vector, if you want to call it that, and reconverting it on, on the receiving side, then, then we're very competitive and we're able to supply hydrogen into Europe, uh, be that from, from the north or from the south, uh, at very competitive rates. And it can be scalable. I think that's very key here is that we can help customers go from low modest volumes initially and scale up and, and we can just add ships as part of that without any major investments uh, on, on the infrastructure side on, on, on the ports. Thank you, Per. Really interesting. And I'd like to thank you both for sharing your insights today and for updating us on Provirus's journey and its European dimension. So a lot to digest. Many indications that Provirus's mission to becoming a leading developer of integrated green hydrogen projects is well underway. If you'd like to know more about Provirus Energy, read our initiation report and updates, and to follow their stock, do go to our website. Thanks for joining us. Until next time.